Uh, welcome to the Best of the Best webinar series brought to you by Noveg, the design software superstore. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Again, uh, we're really excited to not only present what's new in Vectorworks Landmark 2011, uh, but also to have Tamsin uh, going through the release with us. Um, unless you've been living under a rock, uh, you know that Tamsin is one of the most sought-after VW trainers. Um, she's become a huge advocate of the product and has written training courses which are uh, much in demand across the UK with designers actually traveling from the US, Canada, and uh, various European countries to attend her courses. Um, she's being billed as the UK's leading expert in VW and uh, is the author of Residential Garden Design with Vector, Vectorworks Landmark, which I think is actually what she's going to be going through today is the 2011 version. Um, and that was actually published by Nemechek. Uh, she's going <clears> to <throat> speak for about 45 minutes or so. Uh, and then after that, we're going to open it back up for a Q&A session, um, followed by a quick send-off uh, after that. So make sure to stick around. Uh, just so that you do know, um, we're still getting people streaming in here right now. Um, and though we're going to get started, this uh, webinar is being recorded. Uh, and will be made available for viewing after the uh, after the webinar um, at vectorworking.com, uh, as well as Vimeo and other um, video sources. So, uh, if you miss anything, or if you just want to go back and uh, listen to what Tamson has to say uh, a second time, it will be available to do so. So, with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Tamson, and uh, she's going to take you through Landmark. Thank you very much, Frank. Thanks for that lovely welcome. Um, I'm just going to show my screen there, so I hope everybody can see that. Um, yes, as, as Frank says, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes. Um, the very strange thing about doing one of these events is that I can't see your faces, so I can't see when you all get bored or you start yawning or you start shuffling bits of paper. So I just have to hope for the best and keep going for it. So I hope you do find it interesting. Um, what I propose to do is obviously take you through the 2011 release for Landmark, um, but I'm not sure how many of you are current users or how many of you are potential users. Um, so I'm going to do what I usually do, which is just follow this kind of design process flow and pick up various elements as we go and highlight those things that are new in 2011. Um, as I said, uh, as Frank mentioned, I have written a book called um, Residential Garden Design with Vectorworks Landmark. The new release of that book is imminent. Um, I keep saying this because I finished writing it many, many weeks ago, but it's now going through the production process at Nemechek. So, um, but we really do hope to have it. Um, I believe they're hoping to have it back from the printers this week, which is really exciting. So without further ado then, um, I'm going to just talk through where, where we're heading. We're going to look at surveys, how to import data from a surveyor, how to approach putting in your own survey data, um, taking some of the new drafting tools and making your plans look beautiful, some of the hard landscaping tools and where there have been improvements. Um, we're also going to have a look at the, some of the terrain modeling features that have, come, that have been updated in 2011. Um, making it much easier for you to work with your different sloping sites and to really gauge what you're working with instead of just working in flat plan on paper, for example. We're going to look at the planting tools um, and how you can really extract information from your drawing um, so that you're not just producing a pretty plan, you're producing a plan that's got so much intelligence built into it uh, that you can see... Um, what you're going to need to use and how much this design potentially is going to cost your client. So we'll start by looking at surveys. Now hopefully you can all see my Vectorworks screen in front of you. Um, I'm going to open up a completely blank file um, and I'm going to use this to import some survey data. Now one of the questions I'm often asked about Vectorworks with people looking to move to it is can it work with DXF, DWG files, which come from a surveyor or even from an architect or from another designer, another design professional? And the answer is yes, of course it can. So uh, I'm going to take in an, a single file. And if I just find that file, now that's silly because I've just gone and looked somewhere else and now I've lost it. But it is in here somewhere. 
here we are, my web webinar. So I'll choose the file, click on open, and here we go. We have um, the, the settings dialog box. Now I've just had a little, I can just see a little note that the volume is a little low for Tamsin. Can the volume be increased? Uh, I hope that's not a problem for everybody. Let me just see if I can change my settings. Um, oh, there we go. Hopefully that should make a big difference. Does that make things any different for you, Don? Let me know. Anyway, oh, great. Good. Thanks. All right. So I'm now looking at the import options. The key thing, as I often say to people at this, uh, this stage when, um, when they're importing files, is to understand the unit settings in that surveyor's file. Now, here in the UK, most land surveyors work in meters. Um, it really doesn't matter which unit of measure I want to work in. It's what the surveyor that was working, was working in that's really important here. Now, I'm going to choose to bring this in. And um, I'm going to bring this in as all 3D. And I'm going to choose not to center my data. So there it goes. That's going to come in. And we have here uh, 2D information, essentially. We've got all the information about this site drawn up, and that's come in. It's a correct size. Um, if I just take a look at this doorway down here, and I'm going to take a dimension on that. This is always a good thing to check when you're bringing in a survey. And that's telling me that that is one point, nearly 1.8 meters wide, which tells me that I've pretty well got that unit of measure right, because that sounds about right for a double door. So that's good. I'm now going to bring in another file, which contains 3D contours here. Again, I'll use exactly the same settings. And you can see that that data has just overlaid straight across the, the original. Now, that information has come in on its own layer. Up at the top of my screen here, I can see both the 2D contours and the 3D contours. So I have the full site survey here. Uh, the key thing then is to actually understand what we're dealing with. And so I'm going to use the Select Similar tool to get all my 3D polygons, and I'm going to create a site model from them. And just complete the settings here to say how I would like my model to be displayed. Um, I'm going to go just to look at the proposed site, and all of that will do just fine. Now that's created for me the site. It's actually sitting up in the, in the sky. And I'm just going to unite my layers so they're all working together. Because the surveyor has worked from a datum of 50 meters, which is absolutely fine for us to work with, the model is currently floating up in the air, but it's really not a problem. Now, I'm going to model that with OpenGL, just render that with OpenGL. And you can see there that we can really get a good feel for that site. So. The quick answer to that is, yes, we can bring in information um, from a surveyor. You can bring in information from a variety of different formats and work with that. You can bring in PDFs. You can bring in images. So I know many of you like to take a survey and print it out really small and just draw lots and lots of different design ideas over it on paper. Um, and yes, of course, you can take those images in, you can scan them in, and you can do what you want to do with them. And then you can formalize your design in Vectorworks and start to build something that's going to give you decent information. So I'm going to walk away from that file just for a moment um, and look at what you might want to do if you were importing, if you were drawing up your own survey. So I'll go to a completely blank file. And Here in the UK, we would start with a building. I know that in different parts of the, the world, you may start with the boundary and work back in, but the principle is the same. So with the wall tool, I can draw up my building using the measurements that I've taken on site. And you can see the blue data bar just, just to, to the right of my cursor there, where I can enter the exact values that I measured on site. But because this is a speedy demo. I won't bother to put any numbers in. Now here I can 
start to enter information like doors and windows. So I'll go to my doors and I'll choose, uh, I think I'm going to go for a nice fancy gothic door. If anyone's ever been on one of my training courses, you will have been victim of some of my fantastic door designs um, when we're drawing up surveys, but why not? Let's have a gothic door. And I'll just pop that in and then just choose which way that's to open. Let's cut the wall and pop the, the door in space. I'm going to go for some windows now, and again, just for the sake of speed, I'm just going to pop in whatever Vectorworks wants to give me. But of course, you can customize these. You can set them to exactly the width and height and the style that the client's house actually has, so that you can accurately depict what's there and make sure that all of your viewpoints into the space will be correct. Now, for our next step would be to locate the boundary. Uh, if you already have the boundary, your, step, your next step obviously would be to locate the building. But we can use this fantastic new tool called the Triangle Tool. The Triangle Tool is hiding under the 2D Polygon Tool. I'm very sad about that, and I would really like Nemens Check to put it in its own little place on the basic tool set. Um, but you can always edit your workspace to do that. So I choose Triangle, and this works on the principle that I give it one side of information and it then prompts me for the other two and it will then locate the point that we need. So let's imagine I took a measurement from here and I also took a measurement from here. And I click. Side one is the measurement that I've just clicked between and it's prompting me for side two which is close to my first click and side three which is close to my second click. So I can then tell Vectorworks how long my tapes were when I located the left boundary. And let's go for something like 12 meters. Click here. And Vectorworks is now offering me two possible solutions to that because my triangle could go either way. So I'll click here and that's located this corner. So I now have a nice snap point that I can use to locate the boundary. I could also put that in its own class and hide it away so that uh, I could always refer back to it when we get onto site and realize that nothing fits and I need to go back and check my measurements. Let's hope that doesn't happen. That's why you need to get a surveyor really, isn't it? So let's just pop in another triangle here and the same principle applies if I say let's type this very, I've got very tidy measurements on this site. 10 meters and let's click to confirm. So the points of those triangles are the edge of my boundary. Now I would then go ahead and, and put a wall around that, um, perhaps fill the space with a landscape area. Um, and the landscape area is something that you would then use to define planting, but it's quite a nice tool for just putting in a floor onto the space if you're not working with a terrain model. So that's drawing up a survey. Um, the other nice feature is obviously to be able to use offsets. One of the questions we're often ans asked is how do I offset, uh, take measurements which are perpendicular to that tape line. Using the rotate plan tool, I'm just going to click here, click along that line, and that's moved my drawing around for me, and I now have the center of my axes on the start of that tape. So I can then use measurements to position things off that tape line. For example, so if I just tab, I can specify that I'd like to start drawing a meter along and just snap from there. And then we can just return to our standard view. So it's got it all. So in terms of actually how you would approach that survey, there's nothing to, be, nothing to be concerned about there if you are considering moving away from paper. Right, let's move on to having a look at uh, drafting a plan and some of the lovely new graphic features that are available in 2011. I'm going to go to um, this file here, which has in it just a simple plan, and this is the one of the layers that uh, is within the book that I was talking about earlier. It's a very, very simple design, and um, the design brief for this is, is very much a design that fits lots and lots of features of Vectorworks into a very small space that will still look good in screenshots. So it's not kind of your average client brief, but um, that, perhaps you can see there where it's coming from. 
One of the things you will notice if you've used a previous release and you haven't yet uh, upgraded is all of these 2D objects that I have in this plan still display their graphics in 3D, which is just fantastic. It's a, it's a huge time saver. If you haven't, if you are just playing with shapes and you haven't yet formalized your design, you can still put nice colors, nice gradients, nice tile fills onto these objects and then show them in, in a 3D view so that we can give the clients a, a realistic idea and, and they can tell us if we've got it wrong before we've put too much effort into it. But for those that like to just play with mass and space, the lovely new feature is the push-pull tool. So I'm going to choose that now and I'm going to hover over these spaces that I've created here and I can start just playing with mass and space. I've basically stretched that object up. We could perhaps bring this planting area up a little bit. I'm not being particularly accurate there. Um, and we're going to end up with quite a chunky space there. But it's so lovely. If any of you have used any other push-pull modeling tools, you'll find this is far more forgiving in that all of these objects retain their identity. They don't stick to things that are next to them. They don't distort, they remain what they are, and they will, they, they will respond to you in a far kinder way. Uh, so, what else can we do with this? What you will notice here on my terrace is a really nice fill. Well, I think it's nice. I guess it's a, it's a subjective thing, but uh, a nice fill on this polygon, which is representing the paving. Previously, you would have been able to use a hatch, or you would have been able to use an image fill, or you could have put a gradient onto an object. Now, if you were clever with the hardscape tool, you could use a hatch as your main paving area, and you could have, put, you could have possibly put in a gradient behind that, but it would have been a little bit fiddly to do that. The tile tool, the tile facility as a fill, allows you to pretty much define any pattern that you want and use combinations of graphics within that tile fill. So often when I'm sent um, when I'm sent a request, could I make a certain hatch for somebody, it's no longer an issue. It used to be a horrendous mathematical operation to do. I quite like the challenge, but um, this does allow us to, to just literally draw what we want. So if I uh, go to my resource browser, and show you that Dutch pattern paving, for example, and open that up, you can see that it is really just a repeating pattern of geometry, basic geometry. But I've drawn, I've drawn each paver the correct size, and then I've given it a fill from the attributes palette, just, and I have the choice of all the standard fills. So I could even go for an image fill here. Tarmac, maybe not, um, but perhaps uh, if I go for more of a, a granite image on that. And let's change this one to something else. Um, let's go for concrete, good old concrete, why not? And again, if I just exit the tile now, you'll see that's been updated. And we've now got various repeating things. It looks pretty awful actually now, but it makes the point in that we can combine all these different graphic elements within a single tile definition. I'm sure my client's going to go for that. That's lovely. Um, so that's tiles. What we can do now, moving further on, I'm going to select this shape here. And I'm going to use the objects from polyline command, which is now moved onto a right click, which is fantastic time saver. Choosing that, I'm going to convert this object into a hardscape. And I can either delete the original shape or I can keep it. I tend to keep everything. I'm kind of hoarder with shapes that I've drawn because I may need them later. Um, but having converted that, this has turned into... Oh, I've just lost my object info palette. Bear with me for a second. It's the beauty of live demos. 
I think I've even closed it down. Look at that. There we are. Bring it back. So we'll just put him over here. So this object has turned into a hardscape. And if I go into the settings, you, if you've used earlier versions, you'll see that um, the, the information is, uh, the, the, the dialog box has been rearranged, essentially. It has, um, it, it's just much more logical. But essentially what it's doing for you is the same thing. You can create areas of hard landscaping, or you can create paths of a certain width. Because this path shape that I've drawn is a bit crazy, I'm just going to convert it into an area. But we can specify the 3D type. Um, we now have the option to have no 3D at all, or we can have a slab, which is essentially an extrude, or we can have um, a pad modifier, which will integrate, it, interact with our terrain model, or a texture bed modifier, which again will interact with, an, with the terrain model, but in a different way. Um, I'm going to go just for the pad modifier, which will also give me an extrude on top of it. And I can choose uh, to have a particular texture on there. Oops. Let's just pop some paving on that space there. All right, and then if we just render that in 3D, you can see I've just done a very quick render, rough render there, but you can see my, my texture appearing on the screen. Let's go for a fast render works and make that look a little bit better. So there it goes. I'll just stop it for speed. That's using one of the new textures that I've made with um, with the new render works, by the way, which we'll come on to a bit later. So that's my hardscape. But what I really, really love, Nemitz Check have done for us this year, is um, if you have created all your favorite hard landscaping definitions, you can now just drag and drop from the resource browser. So we show this lovely path to the client, and I can't imagine why, but they may say they don't like it. So. I can just choose a different definition, such as this gravel path definition, and I can just drop that onto that area. And it's now picked up the settings of the other hardscape. It's still a hardscape, but everything that I set up in my previously saved one has just been dropped onto that object. So it makes it quick, easy, and cheap for your client to change their mind and for you to be ready for them. Right, so that's the hardscape tool, and we've looked at tiles. Um, how are we doing for time? 25 past 6, which is, I know that's not the case in the States, uh, but that's the case here in the UK, so that's fine. One of the questions we're often asked is, how do we plant? Um, and planting in, if you're, if you're designing by hand, planting plans, I think, have to be the most time-consuming element of the design. Um, if I look in my resource browser here, I have a series of folders of plants. Now, these are using the planting facility that's already set up in Vectorworks. I've created my own plant definitions, but I'm just going to show you how easy it is having set up your definitions. You, you can turn these plants to look exactly as you want, by the way. Um, and I'm going to double-click and just place those on the drawing. And you can see Vectorworks knows what they are, which is fantastic. The way the label is showing, by the way, is entirely um, down to you. I, I've set them up in this way because I'm catering from many, many different markets, but you have control over that completely. Now, when I've chosen these plants, I'm actually able to control how they're placed on the drawing. So in the moment, we're in single placement mode. But if I go for the second mode here, I can start to place groups of plants. And I'm positioning them exactly where I want to um, on the plan. And you'll notice I have one label with a group of, of five there. So it knows how many in the group. I could also choose this third mode here. And I could 
kind of sketch along here and edge that space. And you see, again, it's counting them automatically for me. Now, all of these plants have a 3D element built into them. So again, if we go to 3D, and I'll just go for a speedy render with fast render works, then you'll see that those cross planes on the drawing will start to fill in with photographic information. And Vectorworks comes with a whole host of image props. Ah, now you can see my plants have also sunk into my extruded area, which is, uh, if I just push that down a bit, okay, this is seeming a bit better. Okay, so they're sitting on that, on that space there. Um, these are just photographs, essentially, and you can use Photoshop or any other imaging, image editing software to create your own 3D plants if you wish. If you have your own photographs that you want to use, there is nothing to stop you doing that. Um, so, that's planting. did mention earlier that there's an awful lot that we can do in terms of actually extracting information from our model. If I go up to the um, Tools and Reports menu here, I can choose a schedule. And I'm going to choose, first of all, Tamsin's plant list. And then just click to place that on the drawing. It's a very simple plant list here. But you can see that it's counted every plant that I've used in that space. And if I continue to plant it, it will continue to keep track. All I'll have to do is just update the worksheet at the end to make sure it has all the latest figures in there. But that is keeping track of the design for me. Again, um, if I go to reports and choose a schedule, I could have this hardscapes budget. And I can just pop that line it up with the other one, pop it underneath here, and you can see that it's working out the size of that hardscape area that I placed earlier. So it's telling me how big the perimeter is in linear meters, it's telling me the area in square meters, it's offering me the opportunity to enter a price per square meter. Um, once I've got some quotes from my contractors, and then I can actually keep track of how this design is doing against budget, which is pretty fab. All right, so the schedules are um, easily customized, and you can pretty well extract any information you want from the design. What I'm going to do now is open or is take you to this finished book garden and just show you a bit more about what is possible um, in terms of taking a design um, and, and presenting it in different ways. So if we go to this file here, what we've done is we've opened up on a sheet layer. And a sheet layer is essentially a presentation sheet where you take different views of your design and present it in different ways. So this particular sheet has a viewport on it, which is looking at the whole design completed. It has various labels turned on and off, and we do that just by adjusting which layers and classes are visible. So for example, if I click on the classes button, I can see that in this viewport, I'm showing all of the planting information, but I have turned off the tags, so we're not seeing plant labels at this, in this case until the client actually coughs up the planting plan. Is that a phrase you use in the States? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, perhaps someone will confirm that on the chat. On the, um, on the right hand side of the page here, we have another viewport, and this is looking into that curved wall space there. And you can see that we have um, a background put into the viewport, and we have various different lighting effects. But we're actually looking at that 2D plan just from a 3D view. Each viewport can have its own lighting settings. So it has its own lighting options. We can determine whether we want light to bounce off the surfaces, uh, whether we want it to be a nice bright sunny day, if we want to show any specific background, etc. We can see here that I've chosen this HDRI with mostly sunny sky background for this view. Down here we have exactly the same view, 
and put a reflect copy copy that wall towards and then and then how how turned, turned off, off some the sunlight and and, and included um, 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 more a more twilight, twilight background. Again, again, it's, again, it's, it's one that is you know, is is shit direct directly with the works, and if and if we, and if we want to lighten the air there, we have very very low and light light, and we have we have a very different um um high high level drainage to the light from our being like soft soft light as you can see, and you'll see you'll see these lights on around around the terrace there. Uh, the uh, sales shape is one that I trademark. That is that is that is using, using something some will be nerd to nerd in the phone here. If you are uh, into a bit more really tall, that's how that's done, done by taking, by taking a simple simple shape and so letting it run nerd to nerd and just stretching it. And we have, have, have you another view here, here, here looking back towards the building. building. Um, and you can see here the eyes are there. This is actually one that comes in the library. Uh, with that it works. Um, and, and, and one of the really nice really features nice features 2011 that was the ability to scale, scale and stretch symbols. symbols. So, so you could take that take burglar if it's not it's quite not the right shape. shape. I think in previous years it was nice to have, have, have but if you wanted that, that, you would effectively have to kind of do a lot of modeling yourself to make that fit into a customized space. But now you can literally stretch it in in both directions, one direction or in all three directions. Etc. So much so easier to work with. Work with. Um, and we um, also have here, here a sketchy view, view using one of the artistic render works modes. modes. Um, I'll just zoom that up so you can see it a bit better. So you don't have to throw away your um, your hand rendering if that's something that, that is dear to you. So that's one sheet from this design. But if we flip to the next sheet, Tamson. Timson, can you hear me? Hey, uh, I'm, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt you, um, but uh, the the your audio is is degrading pretty badly. Um, it's almost yeah, it's almost to a point to where it's uh, um, undecipherable. Um, it's getting a little bit better now. I was wondering if there was anything maybe we could could do about it. People are starting to um, get a little worried. Okay. Oh dear. Okay. Um. Oh, I really don't know what's going on. Um, my internet is fine. Um, let me just check my sound settings again. Let's have a look. Uh, yeah, well, I still have everything looking fine at this end. I guess there's a lot that can go wrong in between. Um, actually, you're, suggestions? you're you're perfect now. It's all cleared up now. You're okay. actually good. Well, yeah. it's it's down to you, Frank. You just had to step in there, and now everything is fine. I have the Midas touch, Tamson. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. I thought I thought you were going to come in and say, look, everyone's just left. They're bored. <laughs> They've all fallen asleep. But it's good that it's not that. So, shall I continue? Okay. So now we have um, the second sheet. That's so strange. She didn't do anything, and all of a sudden it clears up. Yeah. It's a what? It's a Mac? Is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> can you still hear me? I can hear you guys. Should I be able to hear you guys? Okay, I'm just going to keep talking. Right, so, because we're running out of time. So here we have um, a second sheet of paper. Again, we're just looking at the same information, but we have this viewport, and we've turned off certain information. So uh, if I look at the layers, then I've completely hidden all the planting from this, and I've hidden my lighting, and I've hidden all those 3D finishing touches which make it look beautiful but aren't relevant in this presentation. So um, we, we haven't had to redraw that. We're simply displaying it in a different way. I've also got a viewport here which blows up a little bit of detail. And one of the lovely features, if you do make the most of working in 3D, you can create something called a section viewport. So instead of having to draw your construction details separately as 2D, uh, 2D elevations, and then something changes in the design, you can create something called a section viewport. You literally cut through the, uh, the design at a particular point, and then you will have your basic geometry. Now, Vectorworks is not clever enough to know exactly how you want to build 
those steps. But it's then down to you. You just edit the annotations of that viewport, and you can put in all the detailing that you want here. Now, I've used tiles in this case to make my construction details look really pretty. Um, but that maybe is a bit girly. I don't know. And again, here we have a section through the pool. So again, not having to redraw. We're drawing how we want it built, but the basic geometry of where that pool is, where the surrounding surfaces are, that's all coming from the model that we've already built. Over on the right here, again, we've got worksheets that I showed you earlier. And just to really give you a bit more of a flavor for those, you have here um, a, a worksheet that is reading the hardscapes, reading the hardscape areas. It's also counting individual paving symbols. And you have um, also, that we have something here which I've set up that can read the surface area of any proposed walls in that space. So then it's a, a logical step to look at the brick bond that you're going to use, and then you can actually cost the bricks and work out how many you need. Um, we can manage revisions, so if you're not working alone, but you're working in, in a multi-user environment, you can assign revisions to members of your staff, and then you can keep track of where the revisions have been made and what still needs to be done. The planting sheet then, um, this time we're showing the whole design, but we have grayed out much of it, and we're just showing the plants and all of their labels. So this is for someone to plant from. Now, I, again, I'm often asked, you know, I just want simple for my, for my contractor. I don't want them to have to see all those fancy colors. I just want to keep those for my, for my clients. So if I select the viewport, what I can do here is go to my planting classes, and I can turn off the color fill, and I can maybe turn off any fancy line work and tree canopies within that space there. So if you just want a very simple ink plan, you can achieve that. So these, these symbols, they have multi-purpose. Right. Um, OK, so that's where you can head with that. Now, I promised you I would show you something to do with the terrain. So I have, I think, about five minutes before we need to move to questions and answers. So um, ooh, now the one thing I did want to show you, uh, if anybody saw my webinar with Nemetschek, couple of weeks ago, you will have seen this already, but uh, this is something else kind of taking us back to the survey, but still on the planting theme, where you have existing trees. Previously in Vectorworks, you would have used the place plant tool to show your individual plants, the, the plants that are already there, but you would have had to turn them off so that they didn't show up in your proposed planting schedule. Well, that's no longer the case. There's a wonderful new tool called the existing tree tool. Um, and with this tool, you can create a, a very, depict a very accurate representation of what's on site and monitor the species, what the uh, condition of a tree is, uh, what any actions are against that. So in this example, we're going to be retaining this tree. But if we look at this one here, We've said that we want to remove it because it's hazardous and it's in poor health. And we're able to display within the symbol a different graphic so that it's very clear what's to be done with this. You'll notice also, because trees, particularly older trees, never have circular canopies, you can actually put in um, a, a maximum and minimum diameter so that it will accurately depict those tree canopies for you. And yes, of course, the trunk can be offset from the center. So we can do that. Now, these are fantastic for creating little sun studies. I have here, if I go to a quick time movie and just play this for you, um, you can see there the models of those trees um, with, a sun, with, with the sun put in there. This is a solar animation so that we can actually show the client what the impact of those trees is, and we can make decisions about what's to happen next. So that's really handy. And again, I have to acknowledge my the, the girl that works with me, Kate, for putting together that demo because it's far more beautiful than my demos. She's really got the hang of less is more in her coloring, which is something that still eludes me. So that's the existing tree tool. And um, in fact, I showed this to um, some architects recently, and they all wanted it. But they can't have it. They can't have it. Only you landmark people can have it. So just think what you could do for them. 
if you have this tool. Okay, let me go back to my terrain model. Now, earlier, I imported some 3D uh, information from a surveyor, and I imported everything as 3D, and I see that Sharon has a question about that, which I'll answer shortly. But um, I've taken this, this, that ex existing site, and here, what I've done is I've put a texture on it, and I've just put in some bits and pieces. Um, it's not exactly a fantastic design, but I really just wanted to finish by showing you some of the new features with the terrain model. If I go back to my plan view, you'll see I've just placed some plants on the model here. Plants always sit on the surface of the model, so you just don't have to worry about it. They will hug the terrain, and they will adjust themselves as your terrain adjusts as well. Um, in addition to the site modifiers that we already had in Vectorworks, we now have the ability to show our model with walls on it. Uh, walls previously would not sit nicely on a terrain model unless you had a copy of Vectorworks Architect, in which case you could use the um, fit walls to roof command to actually take your walls and hug, get them to hug the terrain. But we now have the ability to create stepped walls. And you can see here the one that I've highlighted. Um, if I just render him with fast render works, you can see there that this is stepped and it's actually following the terrain up that slope. And this is created just by drawing a wall, sending it to the surface, and then just running the create stepped wall command. It's that simple. And you can specify, you, you, can, spe you can get it to calculate a third value based on two pieces of information that you give it. For example, you could give it the step length, and you could give it the total rise, and it will then calculate the step rises in between. You can apply them to the bottom of the wall, and you can apply them to the top of the wall, or both. And you can also just say terrain steps, in which case it will just follow the contours of the site automatically, which is just lovely. To do that previously would have taken you many hours of frustration, well not necessarily hours, but lots of frustration messing around with the 3D reshape tool. So that's all automated for you. Um, but my particular favorites are the retaining wall site modifier. Previously, I don't know if any of you have messed around with the landscape wall tool, but I used to advise my clients just not to touch it because it's caused them more problems than it's solved. Now we can just create a network of walls on the site that we would like to use to retain. And we can then essentially uh, run the create retaining wall site modifier command. And that will allow you to specify where the soil hits one side of the wall, where it hits the other side of the wall, and it will also create a pad underneath so that you do get an accurate cut and fill calculation. So that's how you create those. I've already set them up on this wall here. But what's really nice is that that modifier itself, we can still select and adjust. So on the back of the wall here, I can if I just bring that into view for you. On the back of the wall here, I can set that I would like the slope to actually, the, the soil to run away towards the bottom of that, of that wall. And that's probably far more realistic than having it just ending right at the end. So if I reshape this wall now, I'm actually going to use the reshape on the wall itself and bring that down. And effectively I can create a sort of sculpt, sculpted space here and stop my terrain falling away. But one of the other lovely features is this new grade tool. Now I'm going to delete the grade that I've put in there and update this model and you'll see the contours change and it's quite harsh the way the soil is falling away from the edge of that wall you can see that I've got a slope there. I hope you can see it. And now that I've reduced my wall, the, the terrain is actually higher than the wall. But never mind. What we're going to do is try and smooth out that transition. And previously, you would have had to use many, many stake objects or start diverting contours, um, which, of course, you can still do. But the new grade feature is really rather nice. I can click on it and perhaps click down to here. Now, the grade 
settings pop up and ask me what I'd like to do. And it's picked up the top elevation and the bottom elevation based on where I've clicked. It's telling me what the change is, and it's also telling me the length of that change. Now, I can specify that I'd like to change the site model. And it's drawn a grade object on, showing me the different elevations. But if I update the model now, it will give me a smoother transition from the top to the bottom. So that's where you can see those contours changing. And that really does make it much, much easier to sculpt the land. Right, well, I think I have talked myself to about 45 minutes, which is great. Uh, I'm very sorry about the sound issues that you've experienced some way through, but I think what will be good now is if I start to have a look at some of your questions. Now, I haven't been paying much attention, so uh, let me have a look. I can see Tamsin's voice is echoing. Uh, I can see sound is garbled. Does anyone have... Any questions? Oh, here we have. Can the existing tree tool in 3D be more realistic looking? That's from William Page. Yes, it can indeed be more realistic looking. Um, you can use, you can actually use the image props that come with Vectorworks, but do bear in mind that a tree, um, an existing tree, would be quite unique. Now, you could take a photograph of that and you could create an image prop from it, but you could also, um, but you also need to think about why you're using this tree. You're actually using it to assess the, the, um, the conditions on site and look at light and shade, etc. So it is quite lumpy. But you can also put rather nice textures. You could create your own texture on there and use that um, to, to monitor what, what the conditions are on site. So yes, it, can, it has various different uh, ways of displaying is the answer to that question. Um, how do you use classes and layers in Landmark? Um, well, that's an interesting one. Um, I would typically use layers to separate out the stages of the process. So if I look at my book file, for example, if I just whiz back to that one, I use layers. I have um, a survey layer. I have a draft plan layer. I may have more than one draft plan layer. Um, which I can turn on and, and turn off according to how I'm presenting for the client. Um, but then I would break it up into hard landscaping, maybe some sort of 3D finishing elements like containers, planters, the sail shade, bits and pieces. Um, and then I would have a planting layer. But you could separate it out even more if you wanted to. Um, you can also, if you're using a terrain model, you can use layers uh, to set them at different Z heights so that it makes it easier to place things at different levels in the garden if you're trying to create very distinct terraces. Classes, um, I would use very much to break down the different types of objects as I would do in any other part of uh, Vectorworks. So if we look at my class list, you'll see that I have many, many different types. I have lots and lots of hardscape component classes, for example, for the different types of materials that I might want to use. Um, and I have classes for planting. All the different components uh, of the symbol are broken into classes so that they can be turned on and off, as I showed you with the different colors. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, it's quite a big question. so. Feel free to contact me offline if you want any more information about that. Um, do you need RenderWorks for all rendering scenarios? Well, I would say uh, you don't need RenderWorks. You can use OpenGL, but you will have, if we, if we go back to, for example, my uh, master layout plan here and look at this, this image here, it's a good example. If we are, if you're working in 3D, what wouldn't you have in this image? Essentially, you would have no 3D plants, you would have no textures, you would have no transparency on the windows, no reflectivity, and no background. But if you literally just want a plain block model with just color on it, then you don't need RenderWorks. But I do find that any of my clients who don't go for it very rapidly become frustrated and very quickly go for 
um, afterwards. Even for this kind of sketchy look here, this artistic look, you still need render works. Um, you can create something called a hidden line render uh, without it, um, which would be quite sketchy in nature, but essentially, yeah, I think render works is good for you. Um, you said that you can modify direct modify contours directly to edit the landscape. Uh, yes, you can do that. You can essentially just divert them with new contours and update your site. It's as simple as that. So you connect a contour to an existing one, connect back at the other end, and that will divert them. It's not a case of picking them up and pushing and pulling them, um, but you, you simply draw your new ones over the top. Um, right, what else do we have? Uh, lots and lots of sound, lots more sound. Does 2011 have 3D plants for all 2D or do we have to create them and is there enough to pair each plant with? Um, well, that's, that's a huge question. Um, if you think about the number of plants in, uh, in production, in commercial production worldwide, that would be a bit of a tall order for Vectorworks to actually produce images for all of them. So no, there isn't a 3D image for every single plant, but there are, there's a good range in there. Um, but it is actually very easy to create your own if you have any kind of image editor. Um, Photoshop, Photoshop Elements, or even something like, um, no, I can't think of the name of it, but contact me offline and there are plenty that, that you can use. It is really a case of just uh, deleting the background and then you can bring them into Vectorworks and they will behave just like 3D plants. Um, you said you could, yeah, okay, let me just race through these. Ah, Sharon, you asked a question about why import as all 3D rather than 2D and 3D? That's a really good question. Um, obviously, if it was just 2D information on my survey, then um, from the AutoCAD file, I can just bring in a 2D and 3D. But if I know that there is contour information which contains Z values, I tend to find that um, if I don't import as 3D, my contours will come in as 2D polygons with their Z data stripped out of them. So importing as all 3D, it preserves all of those values and then I can just select the contours and make the model. So I hope that answers that question for you. Uh, right, I've lost the ability to hear and understand what you're saying. I apologize. Right, sound is garbled. Problems, problems. Okay, Tamsin, can plants and trees be located on the terrain z-axis automatically? Hopefully I answered that one for you, Joel. Yes, um, they, they just automatically will put themselves on the surface of the terrain. You don't need to do anything. In fact, if you do anything, you can, you can mess it up. So normally you would use the send to surface command to place objects on the surface of the terrain, but um, you don't need to do that with plants. They will automatically sit themselves on the top. Does survey information ever come to you as a point cloud of individual survey points? Can we use that? Yes, it does. Um, your surveyor can give you either 3D contours or they can give you a point plot, um, which you can just then select the points and use those as the source data. As long as it's 3D information and it has Z values in it, then you can use it. So that's good. Um, in the night view of the patio displayed in one of the viewports, are the lighting effects available in Landmark or only Renderworks? They're only available in Renderworks, I'm afraid. Um, certainly the HDRI lighting and um, the Renderworks backgrounds, etc. Yes. Uh, early in the webinar, you imported a, DG, uh, a DWG called 2D Contours and checked the option all 3D. What's the effect of that? Oh, well, that was actually, that was my spot, my deliberate mistake. Um, with the 2D, I really should have just left it as 2D and 3D, um, especially now that we have layer plane objects. They can just be shown in a 3D view. Um, the reason I had that was because I was actually aiming for the contour file and I knew that I needed to retain the Z values. So well done for spotting that deliberate mistake. 
Um, is RenderWorks plants photos edited? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question there, Donald. Um, could you possibly explain a little bit more about what you mean? Um, how do you transfer a Photoshop image and have a transparent layer underneath? Um, do you mean, Dermot, that you would like to be able to see, is this, is this something that you want to put on your plan and then be able to see through to the layer underneath? Uh, if so, you can create any object and you can apply using the attributes palette, you can change the opacity, you can reduce it down from 100% to a lower value. Um, hopefully that answers that for you. And I think we're almost there. Oh, i.e. so that you only get the image. Uh, am I doing any webinars in the future? I hope so, yes. Um, damn it, give me, give me a shout and explain a bit more about what you're trying to do with your image, because I could, I could rant on about images for ages, but I just want to make sure that I do actually answer your question properly. So just drop me a line um, to tamsin at vectorworks-training.co.uk um, and we can go through that. Um, and that's the same for anybody. If you have any questions, please do just drop me a line. That's tamsin at vectorworks-training.co.uk. Um, do you first have to set the Z for a plant before it will sit itself on the terrain? No, you don't. It just knows there's a terrain model there, and it will automatically do it. Um, can I add a plant photo and edit it and then add it to RenderWorks? Yes, you can. Um, you can use the Create Image Prop command under the Model menu. Once you've, essentially what you need to do is mask off the background of the plant photo, crop it so that you haven't got excessive white space around it, and then you bring it into Vectorworks and create an image prop and you specify the background of your plant as the transparency mask and the job is done. Uh, but again, i would happily show you offline if you want to. Um, Dermot, no, in the past the image sits top with a white background. Okay, right, so you're going to contact me about that. Um, yeah, layer stacking. Don, Don from Nemetschek has come in and said that the stacking order can also help with the image transparency question. You're quite right in that you can reorder the way the layers are, are sitting. So I think we're pretty well there. Um, now, I don't know if Frank has abandoned us. Are you still Oh, no, I'm, I'm still here. Excellent. You haven't fallen asleep then. No, no. <laughs> I was paying attention like a good student. Excellent. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks again, Tamson. We really appreciate it. I'm sure uh, everyone out there found that uh, as interesting as, as I did. I mean, I don't even use Landmark, and I thought that was really cool. Um, so again, many thanks to you uh, and uh, everyone out there for joining us um, during uh, this presentation of NoVeg is the best of the best webinar series. Um, if you're unfamiliar with NoVeg, uh, we're the leading online design superstore. Uh, not only do we have the best uh, prizes around, but our friendly and knowledgeable staff is only a phone call away, uh, ready to answer any questions that you have. Um, I'd also like to draw you, uh, your attention to another bit of info, and actually let me change the presentation here. So you can see, um, th this other bit of info I want to draw your attention to uh, is um, we at, at Novedge continue to kind of go above and beyond for the design community. Uh, we've created several communities uh, um, to foster the, the specific collaboration and communication between design professionals. Uh, the one that you see on your screen right now uh, is Vector Working, and it uh, should be of interest to all of you. Um, if you're not already a member, it's free, and it takes about two seconds to sign up. Uh, and when you do, you, you'll have instant access to all the latest information, uh, trends, news, videos, tutorials, much more. Actually, when this webinar is finished and, uh, and it is being recorded, it will be uploaded onto Vector Working for you to view uh, at your leisure whenever you feel like it. Um, we're also um, privileged uh, to have experts like Tamsin or uh, Greg Hillmar or John Pickup uh, as active members on the community. So, um, you know, they're, they're literally a question or, or a message away if you, if you do have anything like that in the future. Um, 
and if you have any questions or, or comments um, about this webinar or you just want some more information about uh, Novedge, where to get Landmark 2011 or upcoming webinars, you can feel free to email me. My email address you can see on the screen is frank at um, or to stay up to date on our webinar series, you can go to www.noveg.com backslash webinar series, actually it's forward slash webinar series. Um, yeah, uh, that's my email. There's the next one. It's coming up with uh, V-Ray Rendering for Rhino um, with Fernando Pedrogo. I'm pretty excited about that one. Uh, that goes down in two weeks on November 17th, my birthday, actually. I'll be uh, doing that on my birthday. Uh, anyways, <laughs> you can find all that info on the screen right there. Uh, I want to thank Tamson again and everyone out there for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next time.